This is the Poet in the Poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri. Marika Golden is the author of 20 books of fiction and nonfiction. And she is most recently, among all of her awards, the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Independent Washington Writers Independent Review of Books and their national conference. Marita, after all these years, welcome, welcome. So happy to be here and to see you again. It's been too long. Yes, it is. And you look, as I said, you look marvelous, dear. You too, and we both had black hair once. <laughs> I remember that, but it is, you have lit up the world in the last 25 years. And I just wanna to touch on some of the things you've done. Of all of your achievements, I have to mention that you were an answer to a question <laughs> on Jeopardy. <laughs> First of all, do you know what the question was? The question it was, um, who wrote the essay um, about famous, famed writer, Zora Neale Hurston, Zora and me? That was the question. That's and, a hard question. And only one writer was able to get it. <laughs> and when did you find out about it? Was did your did your phone light up? Yes, that <laughs> night. That, I, I wasn't even looking at Jeopardy, but I got all these texts and texts. And <laughs> you don't need the Nobel Prize now, Marita. Exactly. You've yeah. got it made. Well, what are you doing now? 20 books, some are in reprint. You are the star. What are you doing now? Uh, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm working on a new novel. I am next year celebrating the 40th anniversary of the publication of my very first book, Migrations of the Heart. And I plan to celebrate all year long. Um, I'm excited about the fact that two of my books have been reissued this year. And continuing to work in an advisory position with the Hurston Wright Foundation. I'm working with various clients in my own private um, practice, where I'm a literary consultant working with writers on their work. And um, I have a two year old granddaughter that's the light of my life. And Aww. I celebrated 32 years this, this summer. So life is good. Marita, Woman for All Seasons, I interviewed you with Migrations of the Heart. Yes. That was your first book. How does a book get reissued? That's a, that's a good question. And it's a good question, particularly when it's a book that gained a readership, but was not like a global sensation. Um, what happened is both Saving Our Sons and A Woman's Place this year have been reissued. In the case of Saving Our Sons, I was very lucky to have one of my other books that came out last year published by a wonderful small press, Mango Publishers down in Florida. Good things do come out of Florida. And, <laughs> um, and they, when they signed me for The Strong Black Woman, my editor said, I, I'm familiar with your work. I love what you do. And I think, and this is in the midst of the social justice protests, you know, of the last two years. She said, we need to bring Saving Our Sons back out because it speaks to this moment, just as it did when it was first published in 1995 about raising a black male child against the backdrop of America. And also with McSweeney's, Dave Edgars, I love his writing, I love his activism, I love his work. Um, a, a young uh, sister named Erica Laval, who ironically was recognized years ago by the Hurston Wright Foundation for her writing, grew up, became a writer, teacher, and she edited, is editing the Other Diaspora line at McSweeney's. And this is a line, a, re, a, a line that's reprinting, quote, classic books, along with, for example, Praise Song for the Widow by Paul Marshall, um, <gasps> one of W.E. Du, du Bois's books. So I was, of course, levitating when she called me and said, we would really love to put your book, A Woman's Place, in this of the diaspora line. So what happens is either it's a book that 
you know, just as perennially popular and they keep reissuing a new edition. Or there are many publishers in this country, thankfully, that really think literature is important. And it doesn't matter whether the book sold 500 copies or 5,000 copies. They believe in the ideas in the book. And I think that's so important. And they will reissue the book. And that's what happened to me. So I've been deemed a classic. Who knew? Marita Golden. <laughs> Marita Golden. We knew you were a classic before they knew you were a classic. <laughs> but how does it feel to see generations? How does it feel to watch a generation change and then support you from childhood? All of a sudden, this person is an adult working for your cause. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it good to live long enough, Maria? It certainly is. And we were talking about the gray hair that we have before we came online. And girl, I worked very hard to live long enough to have mm -hmm. gray hair. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of my gray hair. And, and you talk about people, the younger generation. I have a group of women um, of various ages that I hike and walk with once a month. And one of them told me that she read A Woman's Place when she was a student at Spelman College. So that was enormously, enormously satisfying. And think so, of all the millions yeah. that have not said that to you, but have also read in college because your work has been used in every program, sociology, as well as literature. Yeah. Let us hear a little reading by Marita Golden to hear what her writing sounds like. Just a little reading. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a paragraph or two paragraphs from my new book, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. And this is a book that I wrote during the lockdown. You know, many of us had lockdown projects. And I found myself writing about how we're at a watershed moment where Black women are interrogating and redefining this cultural belief that we have, that we have to be on call the repairer of every crisis, and we always have to be strong. And as I was writing the book, I began to think about the sheroes that are part of our American history as well as Black history, and how invested we are in thinking of them as super strong, superheroes. Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Sojourner Truth. And I gave myself permission to channel their voices talking about their vulnerabilities, talking about their pain. And this was one of the most satisfying writing sections for me of the book because I got to be a storyteller and I like to think a little bit of a poet. So I'm gonna read the paragraph that opens, um, the, the, that opens the section that I wrote about Fannie Lou Hamer. I was one of the wretched of the earth I was a sharecropper, the daughter of a sharecropper. The rich black fertile soil of Mississippi was in my bones. If I was mute and couldn't talk, my body could tell my story. My arms would tell you how as the youngest of 19 children, I reached out to be held by a mother and father and brothers and sisters who sheltered and loved me. My hands would remember starting to pick cotton when I was six. My feet would tell you about the feel of rags against their skin because I didn't have no, no shoes. My stomach would recreate the sound of being hungry all the time as a way of life because that's the way everybody around us was living. I had polio. My womb would whisper and shed the tears I cried when I miscarried and then got sterilized without my knowledge. And after I was beaten, in the county jail for working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, to register voters, my body never healed. How could it? When I said I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, I was sick, I was tired. Whoa. Marie and, Golden. you know, as I was writing that, and I've read about her, you know, over the years, because fortunately, there's a whole new canon of scholarship about her, her life and her work. It dawned on me how revolutionary it was for her to make that iconic statement at the Democratic National um, Committee in 1960, 
64, when the integrated group of delegates from Mississippi was arguing that they should be seated at the convention as opposed to the white segregated um, delegate delegation. And she said publicly, I was sick of being sick and tired. Mm. Now she meant, and we all understood, she meant politically sick and tired. But it was very revolutionary because Black women traditionally do not say in public that they're sick and tired. Oh, We are deeply invested in always presenting strength. I've got this, I can handle it. So for her to make a statement like that, that could operate on so many different levels was very, very revolutionary. And she's one of these people that, you know, like, like we keep discovering dimensions to Martin Luther King. We keep discovering dimensions to Rosa Parks. And her. Like when I was doing research for the book, I learned that Rosa Parks meditated. Rosa Parks did yoga. And that was one of the ways that she stayed emotionally and mentally healthy and lived as long as she did, over 90, I think. Um, and that supported her activism. Marita. What is striking me as I listen to you is that historians have told us what these women have done, but you are telling us how they feel. And that is a great dimension. You are giving the humanity to the history. And that is what a, a novelist and a, a person of your stature does. Historians will show, show us the facts. You are showing us the heart. Well, you know, the, the great thank you for that. And that was the fun part that I could, because the book is a combination of journalism, research essays, interviews, but there are a number of places in the book where I gave, where I, where I could write as a writer, write as a poet, write as a novelist. And uh, getting into the skin of these women was one of those places. That's our job. That's your job. And you're doing it. And also, you're... A, a public service person. Tell us who Zora Neale Hurston was and who Richard Wright was. Now, you may say that's a crazy question. Some people don't know anything. Yeah, exactly. Some people do not you know, know anything. And and people are being banned. Oh, are being we banned. won't even go into yeah. that. Oh, yeah. my yeah. heart. But we let us talk about briefly who these giants yeah. were. Yeah. Well, Zora Neale Hurston was a novelist, a a major anthropologist of the late 1930s who worked with Franz Boas, who was the father of modern anthropology. She was a screenwriter, a playwright, um, short story writer, just a badass, okay? <laughs> a literary badass. And she was so ahead of her time in so many ways. And we owe the fact that we are celebrating her legacy. I mean, she died in um, the 1960s, yet every year we are the beneficiary of a new book posthumously published by Zora Neale Hurston because she was that productive. And so back in the 70s, it was Alice Walker who uh, began discovering her work and wrote a seminal essay about her for Ms. Ms. Magazine, which really began to bring her forward, bring her out of the shadows. She had been erased. And Richard Wright, of course, was a major American writer, just as Hurston of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. He's known for uh, his memoir, Black Boy. He's known also for Native Son, the first Black writer to ever be uh, have a book purchased by the Book of the Month Club. He uh, and Hurston could not stand one another. Uh, Hurston elevated Black folklore, Black folk speech, Black folk thought, Black humor, and emphasized the way in which, despite our oppression, we had maintained humanity. Richard Wright wrote about the ways in which our oppression had diminished us, um, uh, how it had um, warped us. And both things are true. And when I was thinking about um, forming an organization that would provide support for Black writers, this was in the 90s when there was a virtual intellectual war going on between Black male and white and Black women writers over feminism, representation. Um, and so I looked at that and said, okay, I'm going to name this organization for a man and a woman. Huh. Signal that this is a place 
where everybody has a space. Wow, how profound is that? But starting a foundation is no easy thing. I mean, you don't wake up one morning and say, well, I think I'll start a foundation. How much caloric outtake does that take for you to make a foundation, which exists today, by the way? A correction. Actually, you do wake up one morning and say, I think I'll find a, I'll create a foundation. Oh, maybe Marita, Gil, <laughs> Marita Golden does. What happens is you, you get called. Um, I was living in Boston before I started the organization, a city where once I knew I was going to be a writer and that this writing thing had a hold of me for good, there were very few black writers that I felt I could be in community with. So when I returned to Washington, I fortunately found a whole large and very vibrant community of writers and, and black writers. And so um, with Clyde McIlvain, I co-founded first the African American Writers Guild, oh, and after yes. a couple of yeah, which was a local organization. And then, as more and more Black writers began to make, publish, Terry McMillan, um, all these younger writers, and I was teaching at George Mason University. I said, "Let's start, Clyde. Let's start something that has national import." And we were we were so welcomed. I mean, the school that I was teaching at George Mason said, "No problem. We'll be the fiscal agent." Um, my writer friends at Penn Faulkner, where I was on the board, said, no problem, we'll give fundraisers. We'll share our network with you. Uh, we depended on the kindness of, of not just strangers, but so many funders, individual, people who loved reading and writing, as well as writers who did readings for us. So now the organization is 32 years old. Mm. And uh, I like to say that the two most brilliant things I did was to get the idea to found it. And then about seven years ago to step back so that a new generation of leadership could um, take, take hold. And I urge those who are viewing this to check out the website www.hurstonwright.org. And as we're speaking, as we're doing this interview, we're in the middle of our Legacy Award uh, week of celebrations where we celebrate Black writers of all genres. And we end the week with a, the, I call it the Oscars for Black writers. It's a, it's, a, it's a major event um, where we give, give awards, poetry, fiction, nonfiction. And um, just visit the website and you'll, you'll get your reading Jones satisfied. Marita Golden, what kind of a child were you? What were you like <laughs> a child? What, who were you to end up the way you are? Were you organizing your whole block and making everyone show up <laughs> with the right toys? I mean, tell me about little Marita Golden. Well, little Marita grew up in Washington, D.C., in the area that is now called Columbia Heights. Right. And my mother had rooming houses. And a rooming house is a big house. And the people who own the house usually live on the first floor. Mm -hmm. And roomers rent rooms in the house. So I grew up with a lot of forces that conspired to make me a writer. One, um, a father who was a raconteur, who made me listen to bedtime stories about uh, Cleopatra, Hannibal, Sojourner Truth. And from him, I learned what a powerful narrative is. Oh. And a mother who told me when I was 12 that I was going to be a writer one day. Oh. And neither of these were people who were highly educated. My father had not graduated from high school, but he was a voracious reader. And um, my mother did graduate from high school, but she was not a reader, but she was uh, a believer in me. And I think that's what made me a writer. And in that rooming house, I was terribly curious. <laughs> I love to sneak up the stairs to the second floor and put my ear to the locked door of whoever was living in that room and then go down the <laughs> I, call I don't it, I believe I call it with it, all my heart. I believe I it with call all it, my heart. I call it cutting my teeth early as a journalist. Oh, what a wonderful story. Think. What a wonderful story. You were loved and beloved as a child. I was. 
but the fact that I lost my mother at 21 and my father at 23 had a profound impact on my life for many, many years. Um, the, the positive thing that came, the lesson of their early deaths was that I was going to be very healthy, that they died in their 60s. And I was going to, I made a decision that I was going to live long. And so I became militantly dedicated to physical health, mental health, exercise, everything. And, but it did curse me for many years with the feeling that I had been orphaned. I understand. And, I under, My yeah. mother died when I was 23. And they say after the first death, there is no other. Yes. Death. Uh, Dylan Thomas said that you never get over that wound for some reason. It's as if you were abandoned, but look at you, you were abandoned to health, well-being, and to be uh, a leader among women. So let's have another reading from Marita Golden from anything you choose because your words are something we want to hear. Well, I'll, I'm going to read a little bit of a paragraph or two from the, the introduction to A Woman's Place which just came out a couple of weeks ago from McSweeney's. And A Woman's Place is a novel that I wrote in 1986 um, about three women, three black women who meet at a college, a white college in the late sixties and the years of their friendship over the decades that follow. And one woman is um, Crystal, who is a poet uh, one is Serena, who becomes a political activist and travels in Africa, working for the cause of freedom. And Faith is a young woman who drops out of school and marries a much older man and becomes a Muslim. Wait, is and this a reprint? This is a reprint. Because yeah. I read that book. Yes. So when you said it just came out, I have read that in book. New, just... A new edition. Oh. New edition. With a forward by Tabitha St. Bernard Jacobs. And I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction because it was very scary to be asked to read the book again. Because, you know, as writers, we just sort of move on. Um, at least I do move on to the next book. And I don't often look back because I say, oh my God, did I write that? But anyway, um, I was asked to read the book and write an introduction. And I wanted to read, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from the introduction. Um, it was 1974 and I was young, gifted and black. Living in New York City, I was a charter member of the generation of blacks who were the first to benefit from the seismic cultural, political and societal changes wrought by the civil rights and black power movements. I attended American University for my BA and Columbia University for my master's degree. At 24, all that was behind me, as with the death of both my parents within a year and a half of one another. I was young, gifted, and Black, working in publishing, freelance writing, taking fiction courses, seeking out Audre Lorde and June Jordan as mentors, falling in love with a Nigerian graduate student who would give me a marriage that would not last, a son who became my North Star, and a story about identity, family, and finding one's voice and home in the world that would become my first book, the memoir, Migrations of the Heart. I was young, gifted and black. My appetite for life was insatiable. And I'd begun to feel the first indications emotionally and spiritually that writing would not be a career, but a choice. For, that writing would not be a career or a choice. For me, writing would be a calling and the tool I would use to access deeper knowledge of the world. Mm -hmm. 12 years later, my first novel, A Woman's Place was published a text that like all fiction is in some ways autobiography, a map of a writer's soul. A map of a writer's soul. As you say, once we write something, we put it out into the air and move on. But I'm just gonna give you a little quiz and see if you know what you've written. <laughs> so I'm going to name a book and see if you know what it was about. Okay, uh, Long Distance. Oh, that was a, my novel, 1989, inspired by the life of my mother. And as I was writing the book, my mother was speaking to me. Oh, and the next one is called, And Do Remember Me. And Do Remember Me, for many 
I, I really got fascinated by political activism and the civil rights movement. And I wrote about it in a number of places. And, and do remember me is a story of, again, a friendship between two very different women who begin their friendship as civil rights activists. And one of the reasons that friendship plays such an important role in much of my work is because after the death of my parents, I made my friends my surrogate family. Understood. Wild Women Don't Wear No Blues. Oh, that was fun. That was a book that I, you know, Toni Morrison said, and she articulated this so correctly because it's what I feel. If you go into the bookstore and you see a book that you're looking for and it's not there, go home and write it. Um, this is a book that came out around the time when a lot of books were coming out around um, sex and men and love and relationships. And I didn't see any for Black women. So I decided that I'd do an anthology and I simply called up uh, 12 or 14 of my writing black women and said, look, um, pretend we're having a party and I want you to write something about love, men or sex. What are you gonna write? <laughs> <laughs> oh. the, the essays were the result of that. And that is actually, that book is my best selling book. Is it still in print? Yes. Okay, so if we all want you to- You put the that, word sex in, in it. I was just going to say, anybody <laughs> who wants a little sex, just go right there to Wild Women. How about Saving Our Sons? Well, Saving Our Sons, 1995, that book was born essentially, I think, when my son asked me after the death of Lynn Bias, the famed basketball player who, was, um, who died of a drug overdose. Um, and then his brother oh, was killed. And then two of my son's friends at school died in gun incidents. This was, you know, we think that we're going through something really awful now in terms of gun violence. But at the time that that book was written, 400 murders a year in Washington, DC, most of them young black men. So my son asked me this question. He said, mom, why would God let that happen? And so I didn't know how to answer that. So I wrote a book. The Edge of Heaven, The Edge of Heaven. Uh, that's a novel about a woman who is responsible for the accidental death of her youngest daughter. We were going through a horrible summer in Washington where there were all these child murders, children, young children, toddlers, you know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds who were dying while being cared for by mm -hmm. often a parent or a family member. And I wondered, how does that happen? You know, how does that happen? So I wrote a story to answer that question. A miracle every day, a miracle every day. Uh, that was a book I wrote about being a single mother in which I wrote about my life as a single mother and interviewed a number of other women for uh, the wisdom that they had. This was also at a time when the idea of being a single mother was uh, criminalized, demonized, criticized. Mm. And it was a feeling back then in the 90s that you can't be a single mother and raise a child effectively. So many of us writers, scholars, thinkers, journalists, who were women, were talking back to that. And another anthology called Gumbo. Well, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Gumbo this huh. year. And I had the good fortune of working on that with the writer Elin Harris. Mm -hmm. Such a big, generous, wonderful mm -hmm. spirit. One of the first Black writers to write openly about the lives of gay Americans. And um, it was it's, it features 73 emerging and established Black voices. And uh, it was a fundraiser for the work of the foundation. You are doing very well so far. How about Harlem Moon? Well, Harlem Moon is the imprint. Oh, of Harlem Gumbo. Moon is the imprint of Gumbo. Yes. Okay. So how about Don't Play in the Sun? That is a book about colorism. Mm. And 
my, my stepdaughter called me up one day and said, I know you don't look at BET or you don't like videos, but turn on, there's a video that you're gonna like. And it was a video of India Ari singing, um, I'm not the average girl in your video. And she was singing about being dark skinned and loving herself. And I was so deeply, I said, oh my God. And the song be saying popular, little kids were singing it. And she gave me the courage to write a book about a subject that I'd wanted to write about for many years. Is that, the, is that different from It's All Love? The it's, all love. it's All Love. It is, it's All Love is in a, another anthology yeah. um, about the different types of love that I edited again to benefit the Hurston Wright Foundation. Hmm. How about the word Black writers talk about? Oh, that was one of my favorite ones. Again, we were, you know, in publishing, there's these fads or fad, certain kinds of book will become very popular. Everybody will be talking about something. And there was a lot of public discourse and conversation about reading and writing. And I kept waiting for there to be a book where Black writers would talk about their reading life, their writing life, what being a writer meant to them. Couldn't find it in the bookstore. And I did a series of interviews with, you know, um, Edwidge Dondekat, Shimamanda Adichie, Will Haywood, Nikki Giovanni, um, to talk about the word and Living. how it shaped their lives. You know, um, I'm just very high on you. How about Living Out Loud, A Writer's Journey? That is, now that's a book that <laughs> my publishers, I, that was my first foray into um, independent publishing, self-publishing. It's a series of essays about my life as a writer, how I became a writer. And my publishers at that time said, oh, we love you, Marita, but mm, we're going to pass on this, uh, which they do sometimes. And um, I said, put okay. Out. Put it out. I, and I just published it myself. And, and is it getting an audience? It's been, it's being used. Yeah, it's been used. I mean, particularly uh, in the academy because I'm writing about my process. Uh, that's what we want. How I became that's what we want. Yeah. Well, about your process, how do you write a novel? One word at a time. Uh, and if you come, people come to you. I know you have flocks of people you have taught uh, and still do. What is the first thing you tell them? They come to you with their hopes and their dreams. <laughs> I've, I've met many of them that you have fostered. What is the first thing you say? Or what is the main well, thing? I think, I think one, one of the things, see, my, my beef, and I'll go, but it was, I taught for many years in MFA programs. Right. In some of the most established MFA programs. But I found that some of my colleagues um, practice what I call the, the, the Pol Pot or waterboard school of teaching. And mm. that is where you break down mm. the young writer's ego uh. and tell them how awful they are, how bad they are, um, reduce them to tears, and then you try to recreate them in your own image. Bullshit. I believe in encouraging writers to trust and develop their own voice, whatever that is. That's the hardest thing. That, that you have a story and doesn't matter what other people say about that story. Uh, don't be the first person who says no to yourself. And so in the classroom, I'm always trying, and in my one-on-one -on -one with, with writers, I'm always trying to create an environment where they can believe that their story matters. Mm. That's the hardest thing because if you believe your story matters, it will give you dedication. Oh, that is it will so give important. You commitment. It will it will lead you to classes. It will lead you to community. Wow, you have hit you 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 do the heart connection first, and then you go into the the mind, which is the only it is the most powerful tool you have is the hard connection. So I do wanna go into MFA. I know you were 
uh, George Mason, I know you're on the faculty at the Virginia Commonwealth. I know you've been in Yale, Harvard, MIT, everywhere. So uh, people have been dissing the MFA programs. What do you feel about the seriousness of those young people who come to MFA? And what do you think is the value of it? Well, I think the value is that you are in a community. And I think because our endeavor, this writing thing, on the one hand is so, can be isolating. I really do believe it's important to have a supportive community of writers that you are part of. So I think that's one of the main things that those programs do. Um, I think also it is possible to find really important mentors. It is, it, it's, it's, it's a place where you can find established writers, master teachers who will become really important in your career and often really important as friends, not only as mentors. So those two things, I think they're really important. Mm, that's a good but like, answer. But like everything else in, in this society, it becomes industrialized. So you have the MFA industrial complex and there's a tendency for the replication of many of the same impulses that endanger people in the outside society to take place in those programs. For example, the marginalization mm. of writers of color, mm. the marginalization of women's voices, the marginalization of mm. different voices. I'll never forget when I was teaching at one of the schools uh, many years ago, many of the, it, it got back to me that many of the students in, 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 in a particular class, not mine, felt that, well, in this class with this person, there's the writing I submit for the class. And then there's the writing I, the writing that really means something to me that I share with my small group of friends who are also in the program because the environment in that class was hostile, uh, not welcoming. Well, you're telling us it's a microcosm of society. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then there also tends to be, and I'll, rem I'll never forget, I remember um, when Jonathan Yardley, uh, who was the famed, some, sometimes uh, bete noir critic of the Washington Post back in the 80s, as these programs are first developing, he accused them of creating a kind of mass formula for writing. And I said, oh, that's not true. But I think that there may have been some truth to that. And I think that what's happened is over the years, as the programs have grown, the best programs are, are diverse, racially, gender, um, have students from all over the world, everywhere. And they have faculty who know how to create environments in their classroom where everybody's story matters. Um, Amen. That's all. Let us put that on a big banner where everybody's story matters. You know, you've done so much for so many people. Before we have a final reading, what does Marita Golden want now? What do you want? <laughs> what do I want now? Yes, um, what do you want? Um, you know, I want to this life that I have. Oh. You're the second person that's asked me that question. And I mean, if I were to win the lottery tomorrow, I mean, I help my relatives out, you know, set up, give, give, give a bunch of it away and pretty much stay in this house, in this basement, surrounded by- Look at those books. books. Look at all your friends on the shelf there. <laughs> yes, beaming down at you. Marita Golden, your name is surely perfect for you. Let's have a closing work, a little reading. Um, continuing to promote- um, this book, a Strong Black Woman, I'm gonna read a little bit from channeling um, Rosa Parks.
For all that, I was never scared of white people. When a white boy pushed me, when I was a little girl, I pushed him right back. My grandmother told me if I wasn't careful, I'd get lynched. I told her, let them lynch me. You can look at me and see the African and the white and the Native American me. There's been things written that of all the women who refused to give up their seat on a segregated bus to a white person, I was most well known because I'm light-skinned. And because of that, the white public in the North would feel more sympathy for our cause. I was still a Negro and light-skinned didn't keep me from having to obey the laws of segregation until I decided not to. Light skin didn't keep me from getting fired for my job as a seamstress at the Montgomery Fair department store. And light skin didn't shield me from the pain of my coworkers refusing to talk to me after the boycott, calling me a troublemaker. Light skin didn't stop the hateful threatening phone calls and the hate mail that started right after my arrest and followed me wherever I lived for the rest of my life, and I lived a long time. Raymond lost his job too, and because of the stress of the backlash against us and the isolation, we felt like we were in the wilderness. Seemed like Negroes were more scared of me than white people. None of the civil rights groups that we'd worked for offered help. We knew we'd have a price to pay. We'd been paying it all our lives, but this price, this price was heavy and for a while would keep getting heavier. Eventually we moved to Detroit where I had family. Raymond had to get a license and train it all over again to be a barber. And I got Peaceworks as a seamstress. I always prided myself on my grace under pressure, being made of steel and soldiering on. But all that stress and disappointment caught up with me when I developed an ulcer and a throat tumor. And when I died, the city buses in Montgomery and Detroit reserved their front seats with black ribbon. For two days, I lay in honor in the rotunda of the US Capitol. I was honored, but I was honored even more by what some people had said about me back in Montgomery when I was working with the NAACP. Oh, Miss Parks, she was a lady who held my hand when my uncle got beat up. She got my kid involved in a youth program. She was the one who came and tried to get me to register to vote. The unforgettable voice of Marita Golden, and this is The Poet and the Poem from the Library of Congress. The series is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Sinipid Fund, Natalie Canavore, and Sandy Jackson Cohen. I am Grace Cavalieri, and our engineer is Mike Turpin.